Welcome to the Momentum Matters podcast, where we have courageous conversations with women leaders. We'll hear about their accomplishments, their experiences, their challenges, and best advice. If you're inspired by women who have overcome the barriers and gone on to do extraordinary things, you're in the right place. My name is Karen Taradis, and I'm the CEO of Social U, a digital marketing firm offering social media management, training, and consulting. Our guest for today's episode of Momentum Matters is Liz Huntley. Liz is an attorney with Lightfoot, Franklin & White. She's also the CEO and founder of the Hope Institute, which partners with school leaders to cultivate character development. Today, she'll be discussing the positive role that early education plays, particularly for at-risk youth. Now, here's our host, April Benitolo, CEO at Momentum Leaders, a Birmingham-based nonprofit on a mission to advance women in leadership. All right. Elizabeth Huntley. Mm -hmm. I think the last time that you and I saw each other was in March. Yes. When Momentum honored you as a woman of impact. Yes. At our conference. And that was indeed the last conference that was held at the BJCC. <laughs> Literally two days before the country yes. shut down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So welcome back to Momentum. Thank you. Um, I was deeply moved by your story then, and I could not wait. I mean, I've been looking forward to this all week. I could not wait to have the opportunity to um, get that story back out to a wider audience. Well, thank you. So, welcome, and, and we just really appreciate you making the time to be here. When I saw your bio, it's like, with all of this stuff that she does in the community, in addition to being an attorney... How does she fit all of this in? It's incredible. Yeah, it, it takes quite a balance. It's incredible. <laughs> I'll tell you that. So, you know, we've invited you here today because, number one, you're phenomenal. Um, you are a fabulous speaker, which I learned at the uh, Momentum Conference. And um, we, we wanted to focus for a few of our first podcasts on the idea of race and gender and how they impact social equity. Right. There are a lot of people out there who don't have a deep understanding right. of how these things play into why someone may or may not um, have a very easy time getting to a place of success. Mm -hmm. And I know from, from your story and from your, your book, More Than a Bird, um, you had a really difficult upbringing and that has kind of translated into uh, a lifetime of work helping children have a more equitable start. Is that, is that fair to say? That sums it up. Okay. <laughs> so I'd like to start today by, by talking about that early childhood so that our audience has an understanding of what you have had to overcome. You know, I was born in a situation where my parents, they were drug dealers. We lived in a house in projects in Huntsville, Alabama, in the Butler Terrace Housing Projects. They weren't married. There were five kids in the house. We had four different fathers. Uh, it was, my mother had given birth to us from age 16 to 21. So by all accounts, it was a very dysfunctional situation. Uh, but what's interesting is being a kid growing up in that, and it was all you knew, people coming and going, money on the table, people bagging stuff up. It was just your normal. Uh, because we know that when kids are of that tender age, you know, unless some of the Maslow's needs aren't being met, like they aren't having food or shelter or those kinds of things, a kid can function normally because that environment becomes their normal. And, and that's, you had those things. And I did. I mean, there. money was there, there, plenty of it, you know. And so, uh, so I, I was really oblivious being so young and innocent to the nature of the criminal activity and the danger, actually, uh, that was going on around me. I just functioned in it as a kid in my own little way. Uh, but, of course, it, that dysfunction can't sustain itself forever. And my dad got busted for dealing drugs. And my mom, went, my mom started trying to hold down this drug business herself and started using heroin, one of the drugs they dealt. And, uh, and she became an addict and one day packed us up, took us off to different relatives and went back there and committed suicide. And so then, you know, you know you're in dysfunction because we're separated from each other. We're all over the state. Me and my younger sister were in Clinton and housing projects with my 
paternal grandmother, my dad's mom, and um, and in that home, you know, sort of experiencing poverty for the first time, being separated from my siblings. My mom's committed suicide. My dad's in and out of jail. And then on top of that, within a month of being there, one of my grandmother's uh, young adult sons started to sexually abuse me on a regular basis. So it was a nightmare, to say the least. Uh, and, you know, had it not been for the intervention of early childhood education, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, the, the power of what it does in a person's life and, and the hope that it gives to a young child that's enduring those kinds of what we call ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, uh, for the technical term for what I went through, that uh, without the presence of those intervening programs, I would be here because there's, there's really no way for a child to endure that without something there to help get them through. Right, right. And Give us a, an idea. I, I am familiar with some of this because of your book, but um, give us an idea of what age you were when these... Right. All these so when, when, when my mother committed suicide and all of that chaos happened, I was five years old. And, uh, and my sister was three, and then I had some uh, older siblings that had, they were put with other relatives at the time and that I was separated from. So it, it was a, uh, it was a very young, tender time. And, and you know, and as we know in science now, it was during that time when 90% of a child's brain is developed. So, you know, it's really critical uh, that they have mechanisms to deal with trauma or ACEs as we call them. Uh, because, because if, we, if, if they, they don't, don't, it can create permanent brain damage. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you, you go to elementary school at six? Well, well there's there's a, a, we, we can't miss the most important piece, piece which is why I'm such an advocate for uh, pre-K, for, for early childhood education. education. So, so just by quick way of background in my neighborhood, we were going through integration. So, so there were some ladies that had decided they want to make sure the kids were ready to go to school when they go across town. School readiness is everything when we're talking about equity and opportunity because we know in science through all of our data that children with, without the right support structure in their home come to school so far behind their peers that do have that sort of support structure and learning and exposure to vocabulary and all of these things. So. A good, a good early childhood program, program a pre-K, a K-4, those kind of programs for those underserved communities uh, with children are critical to those kids being able to uh, go to school, school ready. School ready is, is, is just as, to me, as much of a part of the battleground of equity for education as getting a good education and a good quality school and that access. So. Um, so, so these ladies, ladies decided they were going to start a preschool to make sure the kids were ready to go across town. They hired some of the black teachers that had lost their jobs to integration and partnered with a local church. And it was in that preschool that I received that initial nurturing and buffering to that environment where nothing changed. I mean, everything was still going on, but it was the power of what I experienced during the day in that preschool that, that helped you know, sort of not only encourage me and give me a good place to go to buffer, but we have to understand the science of this because we know that when a child experiences four or more of those ACEs before they reach age six, and during this time when the brain is being developed, the negative neurological impact of those ACEs can actually stunt the growth of the proper development of brain. Well, when I wrote my book, I went back and I interviewed some of the elderly ladies that would have known me when I was that age. And I said, so what was I like when I moved in with my grandmother? And, and I remember one lady specifically, she said, she said, oh, baby, it was, it was, it was sad. She said, you just, you just went into the shell and you didn't make eye contact with people. And we used to have to tell you to speak up because you mumbled when you talk. And, and then she said this. She said, but baby, you just snapped out of it. You just snapped out of it and you became fine and you're so smart and look at you now, you're all Lord, we're so proud of you. And but that's not what happened. You know, I didn't just snap out of it. Uh, what happened was the intervention, the, the power of a nurturing environment and what it does for children that are dealing with those ACEs, that was the key to making sure I didn't decline. I tell you that story because we know in science that when those ACEs start to 
really have that negative effect on development, that children become withdrawn, that they don't make eye contact with people, that they start to not talk. Some of them go completely mute during that time. So that was exactly the condition I was in before I started that preschool. And then, you know, so I walk into that preschool, this withdrawn, scared child going through all this drama, and I walk out of there with a valedictorian medallion around my neck. All because I was responding to the love and the nurturing environment in that school. You know, I mean, it, it was a game changer because it, it gave me a safe place to learn and be a kid and not have to think about all those tough things that I was going to walk back home to every night. It was really that foundation, that idea of school readiness. That, that, is, a, that is a serious to me battleground for equity. When, we're, when our children are at toddler age, I mean, I have a five-year-old that just started kindergarten. He went to high quality pre-K, you know, and before going to our state K, you know, K-4 program through the Alabama Department of Early Childhood, you know, we, we identified a mm -hmm. K-2, K-3 program where we knew he was going to be reaching those developmentally appropriate milestones. Where everyone doesn't have that luxury, right? Mm -hmm. It's not because they're bad parents or they don't want what's best for their children, but it costs. It costs it's money. A lot of money. The time, a lot of times those programs are only half day programs. So, you and know. And oftentimes th they're full. It, it, exactly. So, you know, the access uh, of those kind of programs to yeah. Uh, children that probably need them more than most, mm -hmm. you know, can be short sometimes. And so um, that's why it's really important. And, and that really drives me in the work that I do for uh, early childhood education and pre-K access sure. and school readiness. Now, I want to go back to the Momentum Conference for a second. Yes. Um, when we were there, you brought a really special guest. Mm -hmm. can uh, so, you know, <laughs> She was my first grade teacher, and there's a beautiful story behind, as I was talking about earlier, the connection between not only being school ready, but early childhood education in terms of when children do go to school and the interaction they have with their educators and what that experience is like for them. So I get up the mor that morning, we're, in the, you know, we're still in integration, and there's still some tensions with uh, blacks and whites going to school and, and I'm a little nervous and I put on my clothes, eat my breakfast. My grandmother says to me, Elizabeth, I want you to go over to that school. I want you to tell the teacher to put an X everywhere I need to sign on the paperwork, send it home and I'll send it back tomorrow. So it dawned on me, she's about to send me to the school by myself. I was scared to death, but I didn't play with my grandma. So I got my butt on that bus to go <laughs> to school. And I, you know, I'll never forget, I was scared. We, we get over to the school and uh, I walk in and I look on the wall and I see first grade. Well, that's that thing about school ready. I, I could read first grade, not because of learning at home, but because of what I'd learned in that preschool. And I stood there a little longer. And there were all these pieces of paper on the wall and, and parents would come in and they would look on the wall, find their child's name and say, oh, little Susie, we're going into such and such's room and they'd go off into the module. So I thought, well, my name's gotta be up there. I'm going to the first grade. So I got on my tippy toes and scrolled up and down the list until I found my name and I saw what room number I was supposed to go into and I headed that way. Well, the reason I could read my name and all of, know about room numbers was because I was school ready from that preschool. So I walk into the school and I sit in the front center desk because the ladies at the preschool said, oh, nothing good happened in the back of the classroom. When you get your butt over there, you better sit in the front desk. And, and it seemed like an eternity had passed, but eventually the teacher started to walk towards me. And I call her my Wonder Woman because I was only six. So this lady's walking towards me with this beautiful black silk hair, these beautiful colored eyes, this pretty smile. And, and she she's looked, white. And she's white. And she looks just like Wonder Woman. Because at the time, the show was on TV. And right. I watch Wonder Woman all the time. And Linda Carter. And, and, and I, was... <laughs> yes, and I thought one day she was going to come with the cuffs and the rope and save me from the bad people because I was a victim child. Yes. And uh, so I, I just light up inside and think to myself, could this be? Is my teacher Wonder Woman? Like, how cool would that have been? Well, it, it, as I said, it wasn't Wonder Woman. It was Miss Pam Jones. But she was truly my Wonder Woman. Uh, because she walked up to me and she said, well, hello, young lady, what's your name? Just as sweet as she could be. And I panicked and all that could come out of my mouth was, 
my name's Elizabeth Humphrey. My grandma told me to tell you to put an X everywhere she needs to sign, send it on the paperwork and send it back tomorrow. And I just spit it out. And so she paused and we had a conversation about how I found my way into the room. And as you know, a lot of things could have happened in that moment that would have completely changed the course of time and I wouldn't be standing here. But Miss Pam Jones assessed that situation and instead of calling child services or doing all the other things she could have done, she recognized that my glass was actually half full and not half empty. She saw my potential, my resilience, all of those things and bent down close to my face with tears in her eyes and said, Elizabeth Humphrey, you're going to be the brightest student I ever have. Wow. So just the power of that moment. You know, there could have been a whole assessment done about me measured in fairness with with uh, data to back it up about where I was headed in life in terms of my situation. And it wasn't to a law firm. And, but what she saw was she looked beyond that and saw the child. So you went from how, to what grade did that school go? It went to third grade. To third. Yeah, and then to fourth, I'm sorry, to fourth grade. So and then you went to? To Adair Junior High, to our middle school. That was sixth to eighth grade. And high school? Uh, and fifth to eighth grade, and then high school at Chilton County High. Chilton so it County was a feeder High. school for mm -hmm. the city of Clinton. Mm -hmm. And what was that experience like? Which one? The high, high school. school. High school. So uh, high school. I like everybody else, like to skip over middle yeah. school, right? Doesn't everybody want to? My just... husband's a middle school teacher, they, <laughs> the, the law group. Yes. Uh, so high school, at that point, remember, we're in a small community. Everybody knows everybody. So sort of my reputation had preceded Precision. itself in terms of teachers anticipating and knowing that I was a bright kid. I didn't mm -hmm. cause any trouble. You know, I was, uh, you know, eager and involved and loved school and those sort of things. And so when you fall into that category as a student in a place where everybody kind of knows everybody and you've got that reputation, then, you know, very naturally, you know, teachers that love pouring into kids are going to try to pour into that kid because they right. know they want something. And, and so uh, there are too many experiences to name in terms of things that uh, my teachers in high school did for me. But I, I, I will, since we're talking about equity, I, I, there's one I would like to mention. And that is this, when I, um, by the time I got to my junior year, close to senior year, I forget exactly when the window was, I'd taken the ACT and had a great score, but not the kind of score you needed to get the full ride to college and that type of thing. And I didn't understand because I'd always been bright and I learned well mm -hmm. and, you know, and so, but to prepare for a standardized test, there, there's just a small slither of folks that can never pick it up, never practice, never do anything and can go and ace it. You know, that they fall in a whole nother category yes. that I don't fall into. <laughs> Superhuman. <laughs> but for most of us, we have to prepare. You know, we have to prepare and we have to get comfortable with the exam and sort of learn the, the style and, you know, the strategy and strategy, strategy mm -hmm. behind answering the questions. And, and I wasn't in a home where you had access to somebody taking you to, you know, these prep classes right. or anything like that. But I'd heard that our computer science teacher had these discs that people were using that were helping them study for the test, just in talking to my friends, because I was on Scholars Bowl team, and so I was around a lot of kids that were, you know, really uh, focused on academics, and we were sharing notes on what we were doing, you know, for the test, and, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna go see Miss Huff and, and see about, you know, using those CDs. So I went to her, and she was like, oh, Liz, of course you can, sweetie. She said, you know, just go to my desk. There's a list up there. Just sign out the ones you want. You take them home, use them as much as you want to, and you know, and just bring them back. Well, there was a problem. I mean, this was the 80s. I didn't have, have a, computer a computer at home. At my home, you know, and, and so even though there was this resource to help me, because of that inequity issue, I couldn't utilize it. Mm -hmm. And, but think about this, Ms. Huff had offered to me what she offered to everybody. So sometimes when we're talking equity, some people that, um, are somewhat naysayers about sort of needing to look behind the story to mm -hmm. see if something is truly fair. There are people that would say, 
Well, Miss Huff offered you those CDs like she did everybody else. You know, she offered you what everybody else had a thank shot you. at. Thank, and, thank you again. You know, it's not the way it is. She's, she's not such there a, to raise you. Thank you, know, you for but she me. did offer you right. something for free that you would have otherwise had to pay for. Even though there was a story behind that and I didn't have a computer. So Miss Huff could have said, oh, I'm so sorry, Liz, you know, and, and left it at that. But she stopped and she said, well, let me see what I can do. I'll get with you later. She didn't say no. Or, or yes. Or yes, or whatever, but she said, I'll get with you later. So she came and got me out of class later that day, and she said, okay, we've got it all fixed. And I mean, and this woman is a little Miss Huff, maybe five feet tall. Like, okay. she is pint size, little petite lady. So she's like looking up to me as she's talking to me. And, uh, and she said, okay, we've got it fixed. I went and I saw Mr. Scruggs, who was my principal, and I met with him, and we met with the maintenance lady. And um, and what we looked at, we realized you ride the early bus to school. So that gives you X amount of time before the homeroom bell rings. So he's going to allow her to unlock my computer lab so that you can get in there when you get in from the bus wow. to be able to go in and use the computer. She's like, I know you know how to turn them on and you know you won't bother anything. So you just go in there and you use them and you go as long as you want to for the rest of the year you know, to practice for the test. Now... That was just a natural thing for Miss Huff to do. She was a great teacher, loved her kids, and wanted to help everybody, right? You know, but that's the kind of thing where when we talk about equity and access to opportunity and access to the things to give you an opportunity to have a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I was lazy. It wasn't that it wasn't my fault that we didn't have money to buy a computer. You know, it wasn't that I was, wasn't was willing to do the work to prepare. It was that I didn't have access right. to it. And she created that access in a creative way. And, you know, and I even remember the maintenance lady, who was a white lady, when, when I would, she would open the door for me in the morning. She was like, you got this. You, you've got this, baby. You know, so it was like the whole school was rallying. I mean, the principal let me in the room. And so when you, you think about that, what does that do for me as a young kid? I feel like these people believe in me. Right. Like they know I can do it. So I've, I've got to live up to what they, you know, they're expecting. And sure Did enough, that put crazy undue pressure It did. You? It put a little pressure too because, you know, they were really going out of their way. But it was a good kind of pressure because it was pressure rooted in some confidence that was sort of being transferred to me from them because they had every expectation that I would do it, mm -hmm. that I would. And sure enough, my score went up enough points for me to get a full tuition scholarship to Auburn University. That's amazing. And, you know, now I had other scholarship offers with the other score, but I wouldn't have gone to Auburn, which would have completely changed, changed. you know, my life. And sure. uh, so, you know, it was, the, those are the kinds of things that, um, we, we have to understand that sometimes there's a different way to reach people to help them tap into their potential, but the trade-off is so worth it. And it's you know, not a it, handout. It, it's it, not... That was not a handout. I had to work my butt off. And, right. And I had to, you know, be on that bus in the morning, and I missed all of my time with friends when you're hanging out in the lunchroom and goof it off. I stayed there until the homeroom bell rang. Right. I didn't visit with everybody when they got to school and we had our little, you know, five, ten minutes in the hall or whatever. And then I would go to my you know, homeroom like I was supposed to. So it was my sacrifice too. And so these investments to address inequities are so worth it. Well, and I'm glad you used that word investment, right? Because we got we, mm -hmm. members of the Birmingham community, mm -hmm. state of Alabama, in return for that investment, got an extraordinary leader well, I appreciate in Elizabeth you Huntley. That. I appreciate you saying that. And um, things could have turned out very differently. Absolutely. Absolutely they could have. And, you know, so it was, and, and like I said, I could go on and on with those kinds of stories, but it was people recognizing that either I, I did not have access to something, I, I lacked exposure to something, I needed information about something, and in some cases, I needed support. So when I talk about equity, I talk about access to opportunity mm -hmm. to 
really understanding those barriers that are there because of sometimes where you come from. It may not have anything to do with your skin color, you know, but where you come from, who you've been exposed to, how how were you taught to try to chart that path and reach out to get advocates. But it was because of those educators in my school system that created a sense of trust that people genuinely believed in me, allowed me to be more open mm -hmm. to engaging in that kind of help. Had I been in an environment where there would have been a, a big distrust with white people, I would have been more reluctant to reach out to folks and, mm -hmm. and feel a sense of them really caring for me and really truly wanting to help me. Uh, and, and, and I've experienced that talking to you know my black peers in college or in law school or even in our legal profession that carry that sort of sense of distrust from having been burned by you know uh, situations in life and that's not to say please don't put a halo over Clanton Alabama it's not a perfect town yeah. I did experience racism I mean I remember one time in high school the KKK did a parade down our town street you know so it, it's not perfect, but it's my community, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and it, it owns its flaws and, uh, and you know, try to do things to keep us unified and, and move forward. I mean, because even though the KKK walked down the street, you know, here we are in 2020 and whites and blacks walked down the street to protest what happened to George Floyd. Right. And at the end of that protest, law enforcement, the mayor, everybody, we all came together and prayed. You know, so it's, beautiful so it's that same community, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you're just not going to find a perfect place out there. If you're looking for that, then <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I used to think that Alabama was the only place that had rednecks and racism <laughs> until I went to live in Massachusetts. And I was like, this is everywhere. It's, it's like actually good, everywhere. Good luck, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I understand. Well, Elizabeth, it has been so nice talking with you today. Again, thank you so much. And and before we before we close, would you mind telling us a little bit about your nonprofit and the work that you do there and how people can support it? Oh, well, so the nonprofit that I started with, with Drake Neighbors uh, is called the Hope Institute. And what we do, we're, we're based at Sanford University, although a separate entity. And what we do is we help schools using their school teams to build a culture of character in their schools. Um, you know, Drayton and I are, are uh, kind of unpredicted bedfellows, if you will. Uh, you know, Drayton's nearly 80-year-old, white, ultra-conservative guy, you know, who ran the Ethics Center at Sanford University, you know, and here I am, this, you know, child advocate, you know, person all over the place trying to make things right for kids, and, you know, but we had that common thing between us of, not just caring about children and creating the opportunity for children as we learned, as we served on Cornerstone Schools board together, but also understanding that kids need more than academics. They need character. Mm -hmm. Like that's going to be the sustaining thing in them that's going to keep them going. You know, and it doesn't matter what race you are, what, what your financial situation is like, you know, what inequities you face at, at the end of the day, it's, it's those strong character traits that gets you through. Right. And, and through that work, um, we have served over 100 schools. Um, uh, we had the number, if you, if you count down from the schools to the teachers, you know, the program has reached nearly 50,000 students in Central Alabama. Wow. We have schools that are coming from as far south as Foley and as far north as Florence uh, to be involved in the program. We've had this year six schools become national schools of character at their schools. Um, because there's one thing I do know from my story and that is environment is everything. Mm -hmm. You know, your climate, where you spend your time. We, we experience it as adults, as professionals. I mean, that's why some people shift careers. It, it doesn't, a lot of times doesn't have anything to do with what they do but it's how they do it every day and right. the environment that they're in and, and, and is it fulfilling, you know, because of the relationships and the client and the atmosphere of where they go to work every day. And so what, how's that any different from a kid going to a school? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I just happened to go into a school where 
people loved me and cared about me and did all those things we just talked about, you know, outside of the box. And how great would it be if every school had that? The Momentum Matters podcast thanks our visionary sponsor, Regions Bank. For additional sponsors, please check our website, MomentumLeaders.org backslash sponsors. Signing off, this is Karen Taradas from Social U.